Okay, well, um, anyway, we're doing it somehow. Exactly. And, and um, I'm, a, as you know, a ham operator, and one time I had the pleasure of sitting there and talking to somebody at the North Pole, uh, actually at the, at the North Pole, and uh, down there at uh, Antarctica at the same time. And uh, you know what we were doing? We were swapping T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. Do you, uh, does the little store that you have there have T-shirts? They do indeed. That's uh, probably one of their top selling items. We all have family and friends back home, and I think if any of us were to come home without gifts, uh, we, we might think uh, Antarctica was warm compared to the reception we'd receive. <laughs> Is it like uh, Hard, Rock, Hard Rock Cafe McMurdo or something? Uh... I, I haven't seen uh, a Hard Rock, <laughs> but uh, they've got you know, your typical you know, McMurdo athletic department kind of T-shirt. We've got... Uh, one with uh, see, I haven't seen it lately. They may have run out. It's one of the, a nice uh, screen print of the the volcano. Well, I'll tell you what. If you can find your way um, uh, to sending me a T-shirt, not only will I pay for it, but I will wear it on my webcam proudly. All right. <laughs> um, listen, uh, are there w w what's the life like down there? In other words, are, are there penguins, for example? Well, the penguins have left. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to see them very much. Well, I, I don't, I don't the, blame them. Uh, where, where do they go? Well, they've got to stay near the open water. And as the ice, uh, the seasonal ice is freezing back up, they've got to uh, follow the ice edge. But even though the ice edge is still here, they've been gone for a couple weeks, it seems. Um, the life is very limited. Uh, for a little while over the summer, we will have uh, whales and seals and penguins and some uh, seabirds sea known as skuas. They're basically, uh, they look a lot like a seagull. But when the going really gets rough, they go. I, the people are the only one crazy enough to stay down here. It's <laughs> not a place that was designed to support life. All right, now, th this iceberg again, it's big news um, worldwide right now. And I I'm reading in the Associated Press copy of the story that calving of the iceberg has moved the boundary of the Ross Ice Shelf southward about 25 miles. Right, in that one location. And if you look at a globe or a map, I, what always amazes me is I've, I've actually spent a night camping out on the ice shelf as part of some field training that I did. Sounds like fun. And, yeah, it's, like I said before, it, it, there's so many things here that you can do that there's just you know, nowhere else in the world can you camp out on you know, 300 feet thick ice. Yeah, right. So I... Uh, Love looking at maps, and then when you see just how huge the ice shelf is, it's a big piece of ice. I have no idea what it compares to in terms of states or whatever, but if you look at a map, that half of the, the area, that little inlet of the Ross Sea, is you're frozen solid all the time, and that, that's a lot of ice. So in that one corner, the edge moved down about 25 miles, I suppose, but yeah, it, it's something that, uh, in terms of how much ice there is, I don't know, you know, as a percentage of the, the total ice in the shelf, I would think that would register uh, as kind of small, although it is a significant event because it's one of the largest ever seen, and you know, things that big tend to get in the way sometimes. Um, since you guys have a lot of time on your hands generally down there, do you ever wonder uh, what might be down 300, in other words, you've got 300 feet of ice, and going back through the ages, say, 200 or 250 feet down, I wonder what might be there. Well, that is part of some of the research going on, as I understand it. They do the drilling of the ice cores. There's uh, some camps. I know there's a multinational uh, group that drills ice cores in several locations, and they uh, pack them carefully in cases and keep them frozen, and then they... Uh, at various levels, check and see what was going on in the atmosphere and at the surface, because uh, the, the water in the snow that was falling at the time will reflect you know, what particulates were around at the time. So that, that's part of what's going on down here, is looking back like that to see what exactly has been going on. If you, could, if you could get all the way down to the 300-foot level, drill that far down, um, I... Uh, gee, I wonder, are, have they gone that far? They've actually gone farther. The 300 foot is just the ice shelf. That's the frozen ocean part, uh, the frozen Ross Sea. That was uh, what would normally be open water, but it's just so there, so 
so darn cold. Excuse me. Uh, the, right. the, it uh, was freezing. Now, over the continent itself, uh, the, the ice is as much as three miles thick. Three miles thick. Three Many miles people thick. aren't aware that the elevation at the surface at the South Pole, where the South Pole Station is, is over 10,000 feet. And that's you know, elevation because they're sitting on 10,000 feet worth of ice, basically. Um, you must be one of the favorite guys. Being the chef there would make you, I think, um, sort of a favorite guy of everybody, wouldn't it? Well, have you ever cooked for a living? No. It, you're either the hero or the scapegoat. Uh, it, <laughs> and when you're cooking for 200 people, you're not everybody's hero. The, the days you make half the base happy, you make the other half unhappy. Huh. It's a, a little easier now. Over the summer, uh, the population stayed at about 800 uh, for the summer months, getting up to about a thousand when the, the supply ship came in. But yeah, you, know, you can never keep everybody happy. So there are days when folks like me. Uh, there are days when I'd rather not show my face. <laughs> you know, it just like any job anywhere. You, you do your best, and you hope you uh, are getting the job done. Mike, uh, from about now, you said until August, um, shortly, nobody will come, nobody will go because they cannot. And so you all are locked in together. Do you all ever get on each other's nerves? Yes. <laughs> it hasn't happened uh, so much that I've, I've seen yet this season. We've been together a month and a half, uh, locked in, as it were. But I did arrive uh, during the period known as wind fly, the winter fly-in, where it's not officially the main body where everybody is flying in and everything's happening fast. It's more like the end of the winter when the first folks come in to start getting ready for the, the big onslaught. And when I got here in August, they, they warned us at our orientation, it's just stay out of people's way and be really nice because uh, the stresses of 24 hours of darkness and a great deal of time with a limited population are strong enough. Yeah. And then when you drop you know, a fresh batch of eager people right in the middle of those, <laughs> the... Uh, the situation can flare, but it's they they choose carefully, and they choose people that are mature and responsible enough to conduct themselves in appropriate manners. And most of the people that I've met down here are pretty adventuresome, fun people, and they've learned in whatever it is they've done before that you, know, you just if you're feeling a little stressed and you need to stay away away from people, then you just stay away from people. And uh when you have your own time, spare time, uh, other than talking to um, a talk show host up here, uh, what do you do? Uh, do you spend time reading books? Um, are you able to get live television there? Uh, obviously, you can get radio through the Internet, but what about TV, or, or do you have to watch tapes? We have the uh, Armed Forces Networks. So we have, we have three channels, basically. One's uh, basically a sports channel, one's largely a news channel, and the other combines various programming. But all three of those channels are a combination of all of the commercial networks, wow. although wow. it's very dated stuff. We don't get much live. I think for some sporting events they try to uh, get us live. I, I've seen some of the uh, NCAA games on TV around base, but I'm not a big basketball fan, so I haven't really stopped to watch. But I think they, for time-sensitive things like that, they try to uh, keep the uh, AFRTS uh, pretty well updated. I know so, AFRTS. Uh, we, we get whatever, yeah, we get whatever AFRTS is putting out. Well, that's pretty good stuff, actually. Really, uh, it's not so bad, and uh, we do have access to the internet. And I think these days that is probably the best source of information going anyway. And it's also a very nice yeah. way, I guess, to stay in touch with your family and friends. Exactly. And you can do everything from read your hometown newspaper to uh, you know, listen to your favorite radio show. And you know, that, that means a lot because uh, we are isolated. The next nearest town is 2,400 miles away. Oh, my God. 2,400 miles? Well, there might be one closer, but Christchurch is 2,400 miles. So you know, it's, it's not like we can uh, you know, just go over to the neighbor's house. So, well, it's, uh, it's let me ask you this. Uh, you know, let me ask you this. There are other nations. It's an international area, I guess, controlled by the UN, and other nations have stations uh, there in the Antarctic. Um, if one of them gets in trouble, 
or if you get in trouble, um, can one come to the rescue of the other? Absolutely. Uh, the only station quite near to us is Scott Base, and that's the New Zealand Antarctic Program Base. And they have a, uh, a much smaller program, but they are entirely cooperative with the, the U.S. program. They only have, uh, I believe it's nine people spending the winter uh, over there.